Yes. There we go. Uh, seven episode seventeen. Down seven 17. pounds in one week, coach. Down seven pounds in one week. So to do that over a little uh, a little holiday, um, good for you, buddy. Because I know. Listen, Christmas time, Italian family. Whew. If I go, uh, food, bro, food, 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 and especially food. Italian, we're going carbs, 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 carbs. carbs. Right. Well, I ate a lot on, on Thanksgiving, but I I, uh, I managed to uh, get it get it back down <laughs> after. <laughs> um, it's probably one of the rare times where I'm like a dessert person because cookies, man. Like, uh, I don't know if it's the cookies that do it or the eggnog. I didn't have any eggnog this year. See, I just uh, I, I love had a lot of. I actually ate a lot of shrimp. I and listen, and I don't know if it's us being you know south of the bridge, but. I had a lot of seafood too, buddy. I mean, first time in history where we're going Christmas, you know, Christmas dinner involved crab legs and shrimp, like yeah. as a non-appetizer, you know, it was like a mainstay. It was phenomenal. Yeah. I enjoy Christmas uh, dinner and I had a new, uh, a, a uh, Christmas Eve dinner as well. And we had, um, we had a, what the heck was it called? It was a seafood. Um, it was like seafood over like. Uh, oh man, it was. I, I want. And it's not. Uh, uh, I want to say it's. Um, uh, what do you call? I'll uh, fra, fra Diablo. That's what it was. Fra Diablo sauce. Uh. Seafood. That like, sounds phenomenal. Yeah, with lobster and shrimp and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, man. I definitely dove into the uh I am full blown, I am full blown seafood man now. I'll tell you that much. So as much as I did not eat seafood up north, definitely have have done that since coming have, have since coming down south. Whether it's you know more accessible or I don't know, being down the shore adds something to it, but uh definitely seafood is now a staple. Um, in the diet as much as it can be. That's for sure. Definitely good though. Definitely a change up though. I mean, I was North for, for Christmas Eve. So, you know, my, uh, tray of Annie past and all that kind of stuff still, still hitting on the Italiano. Um, but definitely seafood for Christmas day when I was back down here, but, uh, not bad. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, so, so we were just talking, you, you brought it up, uh, um, Barry Sanders at Thurman Thomas and, and, uh, yeah, because I had no idea and I caught a little, uh, I don't know if it was, you know, just some clip that came up or whether it was whatever, but you know, it was a NFL network special kind of where they had Barry Sanders and Thurman Thomas. And I had no idea that they were in the same backfield. I know they went, I know they had gone to Oklahoma state together. Um, but I had no idea that they were in the same backfield together. Uh, so I found out a little bit of information like with that, I thought it was pretty cool that, you know, Barry Sanders was kind of Thurman Thomas's number two, actually not even number two. I mean, Barry came in and I guess Thurman was a pretty well-established back at that point in college football and was kind of just waiting to, you know, graduate and move on to the next level. And Barry kind of came in as, as not a big time recruit and was really only playing special teams and returning kicks and, and ultimately flourished into one of the, you know, the greatest backs in history. Uh, so it was cool to see that. I always like to see that interaction between teammates, you know, they were teammates when neither of them was kind of what they were. Um, Although and Thurman, yeah. that relationship continue, you know what I Thurman mean? Thurman Thomas was the man though in college. So uh, I still, I just don't understand how he played running back with that bar down the middle of his face mask, bro. Thurman Thomas was an awesome player in college. Barry Sanders, you're right, came out of basically, I mean, he did rush for 600 yards as a junior. But he came out of nowhere rushing for like, I don't know, 2,600 yards, I think it was he rushed for. As yeah, a- and I, I thought it was all, I mean, you knew it right away when I said, do you know, did you know who the quarterback of that team was? And uh, like I said, there's a great picture of, you know, you got Thurman and Barry as a split back. And then the quarterback who is now current Oklahoma State head coach, Mike Gundy. Um, I just thought that, I thought that was so cool, you know, to see those guys in the backfield all together. That's interesting. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, also, was you know what was really interesting? I don't know if the phone rang. 
Did you hear the phone ring? I felt no. like it rang in my my headphones. I don't know. Um, so uh, so what was what was you, you mentioned that Gore had rushed for over sixteen thousand yards. Um, only two other backs you said did it, and I obviously got one of them, Emmett Smith. So I still have to get the other one. Is the other one Adrian Peterson? Negative. Older. Sixteen thousand yards. Why am I not knowing this? Once you hear it, you'll be like, oh. He's a uh, think eight. about here. I'll give you. Um, I probably this this hint will give it away. Sweetness. Oh, oh, Walter Payton rushed for over sixteen thousand yards. Yeah, when he broke his initial record. Wow, he played that much longer. I, I mean, those are the three names. When you said, you know, what three NFL backs have ever rushed for sixteen thousand yards? You know, obviously Emmett, Frank Gore just passed it this weekend. And then uh, Walter Payton. Oh, Rush. Uh, he did. Oh, 60,000. That's one of the players I really wish I had, had seen live because, you know, my old man talks about him all the time. Like, dude, he was just a beast. He was unbelievable. He was an and he was on horrific. From what I hear, other than that 85 team, horrific teams. Uh, yeah. The early in his career, yes. Like, very bad. 10. He, he played in. He had 10 times he had over 1,000 yards. Wow. Who, Walter? Mm hmm How many years did he play? Uh, From 75 to 87, so 13 years. And he had how many rushing yards over 1,000? 10 seasons? Uh, 10, 10 of his 13 were over 1,000. That's pretty good. Did he play all his seasons with the Bears? Uh, did he move at the end somewhere else? No, he always yeah, he retired with the Bears. I know there's a lot of um, – because the 85 Gore. Bears were his winding down, correct? What, uh, it was kind of like towards the end of his career, but he was still a peak then. But I know a lot of people – I've seen a lot of stuff back and forth where there were some people that were not very happy with the fridge scoring that touchdown. They thought Walter should have got the carry and got in the end zone in a Super Bowl after having been there for all those years and went through all the struggles <laughs> and that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a big, that was a big uh, deal. But the fridge was like an anomaly that year. Um, the fridge was, uh, was fridge could dunk even though he was three hundred fifty pounds. Um, and now you know what's crazy is back then that was probably like oh, and now I bet you, uh, how many D linemen could dunk? A D lineman, a lot probably. Uh, most, I would guess. Um, Speaking of D Lyman, rushed for thousand yards nine of his sixteen years. Frank Gore. Yeah, but he does have also. He's got about four hundred eighty. You know what Walter Payton was great at? Can uh, what what else he did? He, well, he did three. He actually was th great in all phases of the game. But you know what else he was really great at as well? I don't know if you knew this. He was fantastic at this. Well, what is it? Is it an element of playing running back? Yes. Catching the ball? He was fantastic at catching the ball. And now I feel he like back then your running backs caught screens and swing passes. That's about it. Yep. And that's what he caught. But he would I bet you I bet you now if he played, you could put him in the slot. He wasn't fast per se, but like I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I mean he died at 45. Jesus. Cancer, I think, right? Uh, I think liver failure. Yeah, I think something like that. Yeah. Just a random. Now, do you know where his son played running back? Um, Where did his son play? Uh, oh, yeah, Miami, the U. He played at the U. Um, so who were the Man, top? Which, 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 one of these, which one of these other 16,000-yard rushers played at the U? Gore played it to you. How about that backfield? Uh, who was who it? Gore? Highsmith? I don't know. Gore after him. Gore, Portis, and McGahee. Oh, God. McGahee was <laughs> for a short time period. McGahee was great. Portis probably, was great. Probably the worst injury I've ever seen live, by the way. Yeah. Oh, was he great, man. What? Could you imagine those three in the backfield? Did McGahee play at the Colts, right? 
McGahee's played. He played with a uh, Buffalo. Oh, who am I? No, you know who I'm thinking of. That you're right. McGay was supposed to be great. Right, he had the great 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 great. Great knee injury. Um, Portis was great in college. The guy I'm thinking of was oh Edger and James. He was fantastic. Remember, Miami has been used to you know running back. You. Oh yeah, Edger and James. He played with Peyton. He was excellent. Edger James was an animal. He he rushed for 1,400 yards at the U. Um, I always think Miami has tight end you. What's that? I said I always think of Miami a lot as tight end. They were. They were big on – yeah, they did have a lot of tight end. Yeah. I Um, mean, they're not just big name. You know what I mean? I mean, look, Miami for a while, Miami produced just, you know, NFL guy after NFL guy after NFL guy. You know, that's what I – that's what I grew up with was, you know, if you went to Miami, you were going to the league. Edron James played 11 years in the NFL. He made a lot of money. He had 12,000 yards rushing, 80 touchdowns. He caught the ball great. I remember that. What number did he wear in college? Do you know? Uh, what did he wear in college? I don't know. I'm he cheating. obviously didn't wear it in the NFL because it was a single digit. Two? No? Five. Oh, he was five. Is he was 32. Okay. All right. So f- your top three NFL running backs of all time. Go. Walter Payton. I was never an Emmett Smith fan, I'll be honest. Okay. I look really fat in that angle, so let me move up here. Um, <laughs> um yeah, for some reason, I don't know if it was because as a kid. I watched the Little Giants and Emmett. I, I just was never. Let's put it this way: I was never a Cowboys fan. Um, That's sad for you. I know. I did love Deion Sanders, though. He was great in Cowboys. All right. And I also liked who was the fullback? Daryl Johnston. Daryl Johnston was great. great I liked him a lot. Great announcer. Um, yeah, and Troy Aikman. Right. Okay. You ready? So okay, I'm gonna go. So I'll go Walter Payton. Walter Payton <clears throat> of greatest running backs of all time. I'm, is this my personal list or just like who Your I think? Your personal list. Who oh, you oh, okay. So greatest. I'll go Walter Payton, Adrian Peterson. Growing up, I loved Ricky Waters. Don't even. What? I'm just telling you. You said you wanted my personal list. If we're talking best, that I think, the, who you think are the three best running backs of all time in the NFL? Walter Payton, Adrian Peterson, Emmett Smith. <coughs> Is Emmett Smith three? Emmett Smith would be three. Not not Barry Sanders. Barry Sanders would be four. I think if Barry Sanders played more years, obviously, but I used to love watching him on on because uh, the only time you ever I ever got to see him live was on Thanksgiving Day, and he All always right. showed out. I'm going to give my personal three. Number one, number one is Jim Brown. I like that. I love Jim Brown. Jim Brown. Way ahead of his time, physically dominant, fast. Now, angry could play today, which is one of my judgments for it. Could he be a? Would he be an All Pro today? You know, people like to do that with baseball a lot, like you know, because it was there was um, before Jackie Robinson. Got I don't it. think a lot of these. I don't think a lot. I, I know. I love how people. Could you be in every era base? Ed, I think Babe Ruth could have. Right. Absolutely. Now, would he be? I don't know. Babe Ruth would have been drunk a lot. They wouldn't have allowed that. Babe, Babe, Ruth, Babe Ruth. I just think Babe Ruth would have conformed to whatever you're supposed to do now. So you think like Ted Williams could have played now? Joe D. De, Joe, you know, yeah. DiMaggio, Mantle, those type of guys? Best players, definitely. Probably would have been stars. 
Um, See, I think football is very different because it, the game has changed so much. I think, like, I think, I think baseball uh, – yeah. Well, football is different because it has changed so much. I think baseball um, – like I don't think that I think both the both the um uh major leagues and uh the Negro leagues had their share of really good pitchers and so you really had an opportunity to so right. I think it's comparable like the guy who was the uh the greatest home run champ um for no, no, no. He had more home runs than Babe Ruth. He played in only in the Negro Leagues. Um, no. uh, the hardest spart- sport, I think, to do that with is basketball. It was uh, – uh, who he, he was um, – hold on. He was the home run king of all time. He was great. I, I can't believe I can't. I can't believe it slipped my like Satchel Page before he came. He didn't come to the major leagues until uh, he was old. I want to say like I, I could be wrong. Forty, uh, Josh. Well, like uh, like a Willie Mays. Um, let's see, is it Josh Gibson? Was that the home run king? I uh, no, that's not the home run king. That's the pitcher. Uh, well, you got Hank Aaron, but that's the seventies. Well, Hank Aaron's a great, great, obviously. Well, yeah, but he was in the seventies. He was post. Well, I mean, like, I, I think, yeah, Hank Aaron. I, I, that's why you're right. Like, baseball doesn't change uh, uh, that much, you right? Know? Um, like I said, I think the hardest sport to do it with is basketball. So, all right. So, getting back, to, let me get back to basketball. Well, Jim Brown back. number, yeah, basket. I mean, you know, like, it's just so different. Like these baseball guys are playing now. I think that's why they didn't have a hard time, uh, uh, fit, even though there was obviously two leagues. They were able to get people into the um, into the uh, Hall of Fame. I think basketball is more difficult because it, yeah, you had uh, the different athletes, thing, you know, like and the yeah, game like, like, three point shot, right? Like and you, but you just like and like defense is totally different. Like nobody plays defense now. Everything is like you know all these games are you know one thirty to one twenty something like that. Like. Yeah, where was the the question is where was the sweet spot in basketball? I mean, look, obviously LeBron Soon as Jordan left. But yeah, like LeBron James is physically superior to not just not just a, a, a great player. No, just in general. Physically dominant player. Um like even Jordan didn't win anything until he hit the weight room. Yep. All right, so let me see. Um, top three, so top three running backs. Number right, one, Jim, have Brown, Jim Brown. Jim Brown, Emmett Smith, and Barry Sanders. Those are my three. Now, obviously, my three are a large reflection of the time period. My also rands are Walter Payton, um, uh, uh, Adrian Peterson is probably a little bit down the list. Um, I think Ladanian Tomlinson for a really short time period was there. He was unstoppable for a couple of seasons. Yeah. For, um, but to- I also think that that was in the – Ladanian Tomlinson played when the transition of the running back started to take place. I think right. Adrian Peterson saw the last couple years – of it and was there through it where it ended. Oh, know? Eric Dickerson was my unbelievable. My dad loves that guy, bro. Tony, my, now my favorite as a kid, my favorite player uh, um, as a kid was Tony Dorsett. Um, that was Pitt guy, right? Yes. And he was a Heisman Trophy winner. He rushed for like 1,200 yards. He didn't play that long. He played for maybe 10 years. He was small. You ready for this? He weighed 190 pounds, played – uh tailback in the NFL. It's unbelievable. He was, but he was so fast. He le- legit like was like legit, like four, three speed. Well, that's know? what my dad always talks about Dickerson. He's like, you didn't even think he was running. He just like glided. He glided. Oh, he was great. Dickerson was great. Where did uh, he go to college? A Dick- oh, he SMU. Oh, um, who was far away. Okay. So Dickerson, 
Did, well, you saw the you saw the thirty for thirty, right? With yeah, what was that? The um, thirty for thirty. Yeah, where they killed the program, right? The death penalty. Death, did you see that? Yeah, because well, they were all large, taking money, right? A large part of it was. Now he denies it, so so you know I don't know if I buy it, but um, but he, he says to the day he dies, <laughs> he ain't never saying nothing. Now what about like Earl oh, Eric? The the back foot they were called the Pony Express. It was Eric yeah. Dickerson. Can you name the other guy in the Pony yeah. Express? Absolutely not. Craig James. Do you know who Craig James is? He used to be a broadcaster. Uh, yeah, you know I hate that guy. Also the guy that got uh got Leach fired at a tech he, he cried because his kid was soft. <laughs> yeah, I was. I I don't remember. I, I it's something with a concussion or something. Yeah, he locked him in a shed. <laughs> <laughs> Leach is nuts. Leach is nuts. Um. Leach uh, is so nuts that when certain kids back at, at, when he first started at Texas Tech, if they weren't doing good in school, he would bring a desk, put it on the sideline, and make them do their homework while they watched practice. True story. I'll give you an, I'll give you another guy who's probably in the top ten. Marshall Falk loved him. I liked him when he was with the Colts before he got to the Rams. And him, just like Edger and James, but he was even I think better at it than Edger and James. What college? He was a fantastic was a receiver. San Diego State, come on. Yeah. You know, you know, it's hard to stump me in colleges because I love college football. Me too. I definitely, I you definitely, really, I definitely really have to. But he was, uh, and he was part of the fastest show on turf. Remember when he went to St. Louis? Yep. Marshall Falk, Isaac Bruce, Tory Holt. Tory Holt. Quarterback was Kurt Warner. Head coach was Dick Vermeil. Mike Martz, offensive coordinator. Wasn't he the head coach? Dick Vermeil. Dick Vermeil was the head coach when they won the Super Bowl. I, In the first year, who was the starting quarterback at the beginning of the year? Do you know? That's a good one. And then Kurt Warner came out of nowhere. Did Dick Vermeil win the Super Bowl? With the Rams when they beat the Titans. And Mike March was the OC, huh? And he took over after. Okay. So th that was the fastest show on turf. Dick That Vermeer. was the first season of it. And and they won the Super Bowl. They beat the Titans. They won the Super Bowl. That was when they won. 13. And my question is, who was the starting quarterback at the beginning of the year? That was Marshall Fork's first year there. Who was the starting quarterback at the beginning of the year? I don't know. Who? He went on and actually had a very good career after the fact. Like, but Kurt Warner just came out of nowhere. This guy actually, I, I believe, it, yeah, I believe oh, it was. I, I, I have to. I imagine. believe it was a torn ACL, like in preseason. Trent Green was he the guy? No, that wasn't him. That was Gus Farad who had butted the, uh, the, uh, um, he had. Butted. Kurt Warner was like a third string, second string guy bagging groceries. And then all of a sudden, the, the Rams were excited, had thought they, you know, finally found a good – they had, you know, gotten Trent Green. He was going to be a good quarterback. They were finally getting out of the basement. And then, like, preseason game three or game one, somewhere around there, it was like, bam, torn ACL, and it was like, oh, my God. Dick like, Vermeil is Dick Vermeil's amazing. He turned around – So many teams. Three different pro teams. The Eagles, which they went to the Super Bowl and lost. Um – the 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 Rams. He won the Super Bowl, and then he went to Kansas City. And look who his quarterback was. Look who he took with him. Uh, Montana. Trent Green. Oh, Trent Green. He had with him. Trent Green, great announcer. Oh, I think he does games for CBS. Interesting. And they had Priest Holmes. He was good for a brief while. Bro. Priest Holmes was awesome. Freak. Priest what, Holmes. What college? Priest Holmes. Hold on. Let me think about this. Remember, you did just say it's tough to stump you. I know. Priest Holmes. I he also see. had a really scary, bad neck injury, right? That almost put him in jeopardy to ever play. I want to say Priest Holmes. Was he? he oh, 
Please don't. Texas? No. It is Texas, but which Texas? Uh, so it must not have been Texas. So it must be <laughs> Texas and Yeah. Hey, must be. Texas a and guy. Texas for some reason. I, I just Texas and M. So it was Texas and M. I was just thinking that I, I was thinking he was from Texas. I don't know why. He was little. I, I did I didn't even I there's something in my head that makes me think like I feel like I watched him in college some but um and then uh uh so then Mike Mark Mike March never won a Super Bowl as a head coach, I guess. I think that's when they lost to the Patriots, which started that run. Hey. Where is um I'm trying to see where the the guy we just mentioned is right. Clinton Porn said rushed for 9,000 yards. Sean Alexander Sean Alexander was great for a brief time. Earl Campbell was great. He was really good. McGaigie had a decent career. Herschel Walker's up there. Ernest Biner, Roger Craig. I'm just looking at the Priest Holmes rushed for 8,000 yards in his career. It, it's it's interesting with running backs like they you got get, a three-year window, man. Like you, you normally, they ain't good for longer than that. They just they, too many hits on the body. Like Priest Holmes rushed for twenty-one touchdowns. Oof. I mean, Ladainian Thomas in, in, in is early. Oh, he just used to score touchdown, 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 touchdowns uh, all over the place. He scored twenty-eight in two thousand six. That's in, in the pros. If someone scored twenty-eight in high school. You'd be like that guy's first team all state. He scored actually he scored twenty eight rushing, so he scored overall. He's because he caught because yeah, he could catch the ball a lot out of the backfield. A lot of catches. Listen, in two thousand three, you ready for this? He had a hundred receptions. Who did? Yeah, that's incredible. That's who Priest? No, that's uh, Ladainian Tomlinson. 100 receptions in 2003. He had, he had in his career 624 catches. So the year he scored 20 touchdowns, he also had three receivers. So he had 31. Right. Wow. Because that was a record. That's insane. 31 touchdowns. He, he went to TCU. I knew that. And they never went. And they the Chargers weren't were, – were they even in AFC finals? They never won the big one, I'll tell you that. I don't know if they were ever great. I don't know. But he 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 was he had 145 touchdowns. The most impressive thing about Jim Brown was his average yards per carry. He averaged 5.2 yards per carry in a in a in an era where all they did was run. So you knew he had the ball. And what was impressive was he was a great pass catcher. So he only that was that's the difference I think between like obviously I think Barry Sanders could have caught the ball out of the backfield, but could have Emmett Smith caught the ball as well out of the backfield. Emmett Smith was a great pass catcher. He had a million catches. So Jim Brown and Everett that he didn't throw that much. He had two hundred and sixty catches in his career. Which is pretty impressive. And he retired early. Nine years. In nine years, Jim Brown had seven thousand yard uh, efforts, but the other two were nine forty two and nine ninety six. Jim Brown's first four years, they only had twelve games in the season, and his last five years, they had fourteen. Right, and then you look at a guy like like Frank Gore, who's in year what of his career? You know what I mean? Like he's played how many more games? He's played seven, eight more years, seven, eight more years. But Jim Brown averaged. You right, ready for this? Jim Brown averaged over a hundred yards per game for his career. He was also, I believe, an All American at what other sport? He was great at lacrosse. I, I I guess Major Peace has liners too. Hey, let me see. Emmett Smith. He, Emmett Smith caught a lot of balls too. Yeah. Emmett Smith had a lot of catches. He well, had that five, was that West Coast offense type stuff. Yeah, he had five to fifteen catches in his career. He didn't score as many touchdowns. 
Uh, rushing, rushing, he had two, a year of 21 to 25. He had 164. He, uh, he played in 219, 20, 226 games in his career and 18,355 yards. So he's like under 90 yards a game. That's that's what's so impressive. Yeah, but you know what probably hurt him too was those, you know, that last couple seasons or wherever where he tried to do it, not in Dallas. Right. But what you average per game is still what you average per game. Like Jim, let's see, Walter Payton averaged around 90-something yards per game in his career. Jim Brown has to have the highest yards per game average. Gore would, is like – Gore is 241. Gore is like 75 yards a game. Um, I'm trying to think of someone who would – maybe LaDainian Tomlinson. LaDainian Tomlinson averaged like 85 yards per game. I don't know if there's anybody who averages – let me see. Maybe Eric Dickerson maybe. Eric Dickerson is like 90 yards, 91, 92 yards a game. I'm just doing it roughly off my head. I don't know if there is a guy. I'm trying to think if there's any guy that averages 100 yards per game in his career. Marshall Falk's like 70. No, they're all probably – I mean, you're thinking t- that's tough, man. How about Gale Sayers? Gale Sayers because he got hurt early. I wonder what he – Oh, that's – that. he might have been on my list. He's the best athlete to ever play running back, definitely. Gales, uh, I agree with that. I mean, at, before he blew out his knee, I mean, he was, you know, they didn't have surgery like they have it now. Right. He did it all without that stuff. Because his career, I don't think he rushed for, let me see how many yards he didn't rush for. Oh, yeah. He only rushed for 4,900 yards. But he only played six years. Uh, seven. Yeah, see, his last two years in the NFL, he obviously was after, this was post- he was comeback man of the year, I think, in '69, and then it was it. That was it. He was shot because I think he came off his came back from his knee, right? And then it, he couldn't do because he used to be a nasty return man too, right? Insane return man. So he averaged like ninety. Uh, the last two years killed him, but uh, let me see, kick returns, punt returns. Great kick returner. Wow. Yeah. Great kick returner. He only played lit one, two, three, four, five years in five, six years. I mean, if you count the last two years where we played two games each. That's so crazy. So he really played four seasons. It's five, wild. Se- five seasons in the NFL. It's absolutely wild. He played five the other two years he was doing nothing. Two, five five true years in the NFL. That's it. And he averaged thirty point six yards a kick return and fourteen point five yards a punt return. Oh my god, fourteen yards of a punt return? That's ridiculous. Yeah, he was great athlete. Oh great. My god, great athlete. Yeah, he he was pretty damn good. And he rushed the for a University of Kansas guy. Oh yeah, he, uh, I always say he was like a track, track guy, track champion. The uh, Gale Sayers was known for like his speed. He's he was pretty damn good. He was fast, dude. Yeah. So um, anyway, well, uh, that was good intro. Um, college, some some. What would you think about the Coastal Liberty game? At, the end part of that game, the end. Let's go right to the end, where before before overtime, now Liberty ends up winning the game on a field goal, blocked because Coastal Carolina's got blocked. But what before Liberty won an OT, the end of the game, they were trying to set up for a field goal to win. But they told the running back to not score because they didn't want to give Coastal a chance. Yeah. And then what happened, well, maybe we can 
see if I can pull it up, although we always get flagged every time we pull these things up. I mean, I like the fact that, look, I mean, that game was supposed to happen earlier in the year, and obviously Coastal went out and, and picked up, B, or BYU and, and Coastal got a game together, and it turned out to be a great spot for Coastal, you know. Uh, so I'm just glad that, you know, that game finally went off and they got to be able to, to play it and, and actually, you know, actually play it on the field uh, rather than just, you know, what would have happened, should have, you know, could have, would have, whatever. Uh, so I'm just glad the game got off, and it turned out to be an absolute great game i mean liberty literally came out swinging uh and you know it was, like i said it, i'm glad that it got to get played out on the field itself how you about know? the running back doing the snow angels on the field crazy right he's so happy after what happened so i've said the yeah, same otherwise he's the guy so uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna play it real quick get out of orlando okay with his second straight and, goal uh, hold on technical difficulties with me as the director of uh the, producer. Oh, the director, did <laughs> my my uh, I'm a director full time too. Come on now, you didn't know that, did you? Add it to the list. Add it. All right, here we go. You ready? Just make tell me you can see it. All right. Good. Let's go back here. So such so stage. So the play before this, he goes to the run. No one comes near him. He eats up clock and then he takes a knee. This is the running back. Then this happens. This is going to play for a last-second field goal to get out of Orlando with his second straight bowl victory. Oh, but Kelly this time drifts into the end zone, lost the football. The ball came out. Unbelievable. So as as he was going across, they were, he was trying to hold himself from going in, which I thought was – Look how much time is on the clock, 40 seconds. I thought it was ridiculous. I thought the first time I get it, the second one. You got to get in. Just get in the end zone. You you feel them pulling you. Just score. Like I yeah. like, So is that an instruction thing? Should they have said, hey, listen, if you have that much space. Then just go. Either just take a knee or if they're giving you that much space, just run it into the end zone. There's 40 right. seconds. That's another thing. Like, hey, look, if there's 40 seconds, it, whatever, take away, you know, another five for the kick return, you know, whatever. I mean, look, like they're going to be – look, below 40 seconds in college football or just in football in general, that's, you know, for them to put something together to go down and have to make a – like, look, if you have the opportunity to get points and to put you in a better situation, just take the points, you know, automatically. Or there needs to be better explanation, like – Look, I mean, as a running back in that situation, you have to know that they're going to try to do everything to get the ball one way, shape. You know what I mean? So, ball security should be the first thing on your mind. You know? Agreed. I, yeah, I, I just didn't understand. Um, I mean, they almost look. They almost blew it. You know what I mean? They had an opportunity. It was there, and they almost blew it. it like I said. And like I say, I say we say it all the time. Like sometimes you out, you start over coaching. Like just do what you're supposed to do, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think – You're in the end zone. Score the points. We'll deal with it. Let's go. I think they overcoached that situation. Now, it worked out. They won, but they would have been kicking themselves if they lost that one. That would have been horrific. Yeah. Now, and and and, and, I, and, and it has – it was happened. I was thinking to myself, Coastal is – like, this is this is their destiny or something. You know right. what I mean? Like, but this you know is what? supposed to be happening. There – is no such thing as destiny. There is you have to do the job on the field. Des Destiny's nice for like um, the newspapers and all those kind of it's things. Great for a movie. It's great for a movie. Oh, awesome! You know, ah, oh, you meet the girl of your dreams. It was destiny. <laughs> In reality, you come home and she's saying, "Hey, pick your clothes up off the floor." So, you know, and that goes both ways, by the way, not just uh, guys to girls, but girls to guys. Um, just in case we have any uh, female uh, listeners, who knows? We may. I would hope so. I hope we do. So we go across, we, we talk a lot of stuff out here, man. Yeah, I mean, you know, we like to have female listeners. It'd be great. Yeah. You know, they, 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 they broke the... Uh, Gender barrier this year in football. 
<laughs> they did. And now she's off to where? What's that? Now she's off to where, Wake Forest? No, uh, Wake Forest? That was North Texas. Maybe. Maybe but I don't know. I, I don't really follow uh, um, that. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, I think that that's uh, – uh, that was that that was a, a, a it, if that was the situation you'd get in the end zone expl- or explain exactly what to do and have one or two quick decisions so there is no such thing as as an issue like that um coastal where do they deserve to be ranked do they should they be top 20 yeah i think so I think so. I think after I think very deserving. So you're looking at some other teams that are in here. I mean, look, they they actually played it out on the field for most of their games. So I think that in itself deserves you know a, a little bit more of a, a, a you know gives them a couple extra points in that retrospect. Um, but yeah, I think they're a top twenty team automatically. I said even even with that loss, you know what I mean. They they dialed it up. They played who they had to play. Great season. I hope it continues because I would love to see them as a constant discussion going forward. Um, I would hate to see this be like a one year wonder type of thing. I don't think it will be. Uh, I think they will continue to do what's, what's right and, and continue to progress uh, along those ranks and hopefully be a, a perennial top 25 team for years to come. I think it was great for college football though. It was great for college football. I think it was a, a an exciting aspect of it, and a good um, and a good thing for for those other teams that are looking to make that jump to 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 FCS ball. You know, from FCS to FBS, and, and you know, kind of that look like it can happen. You can think it's not. You know, you're always going to be a doormat type of thing, or as you get to this Division One level, like you know, you got to take your lot. Like Coastal did it. You know, and whether it's because, you know, you could say a million, you know, it's the offense they run, it's the, this type of thing they played, it's COVID, so it's different. You know, look, like, I just think that that's a, it's a good thing and, and it's going to, I hope, hopefully entice other programs to continue to strive to get to that level. <clears throat> now, did you write down my picks as well as yours? Because I just want to run through what we've gone through so far. I did. Yeah, I have your picks. I mean, actually, no, I think I just wrote down mine, but. I'm okay. sure you can kind of as we I remember, I remember it. Um, App State, I won. You picked North Texas, right? Right. That was a Myrtle Beach boring bowl. Um, famous Idaho Potato Bowl, Nevada over Tulane. I think we both picked Nevada, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, Boca Raton Bowl. I think you picked UCF. And, yeah, that's a loss. And I picked. Did I pick BYU? Yeah, you did. Yeah, so that's a two to one. Uh, Louisiana, Louisiana Tech. I picked Louisiana Tech. You picked Georgia Southern, right? I, that's a win for you. Uh, Montgomery Bowl. I picked Memphis. You picked FAU. I won that one. Mm-hmm. New Mexico Bowl. I think we both picked Hawaii, right? Yep. So, um, so that's I don't know what that record is, and then uh. Camellia Bowl. What is the Carmelia? Camellia Bowl. What is what is that? Some sponsor that wanted to throw money. Someone named Camellia. That's cool. Hey, that wouldn't that be cool? How how about how, game named after you? Wouldn't it be cool to be called the had the football and the kitchen sink bowl? <laughs> if we gave them enough money, we could have our own bowl. You give enough money, you can do a lot of things. Yep. <clears throat> Imagine that. We get a Who lot of that. We get a lot of viewers on our podcast after that. We just need like 500K. Um, throw at it. It's not that much. No, no, no big deal. Uh, disposable money. Hmm. Just throwing around. Okay, so what was a uh, Marshall? Oh, Marshall Buffalo. I think I think I took the buff. No, no, you took the buffs. I took Marshall. Right. Buffalo won. Buffalo won. Buffalo won. What did that guy rush for? Uh, um, our go- our guy, Coach Huggins, gets a W in his first bowl appearance as a coach. It's pretty cool. What other what are um the, are the running back didn't play? Is he hurt? Did he opt out? Oh, well, what what do you do? Maybe he opted out. You think so? No, I don't I think he's that type of kid. Yeah, I think he had a hurt. 
<laughs> okay, you had me going on that one. Okay, and oh, now we're up to okay, Liberty Coastal. I took Coastal. I th I think I took Coastal also. I think you did. Uh, Georgia State, Western Kentucky. I took State. You took Western, Western Kentucky. Who won? Georgia State. <sighs> And then Louisiana, UTSA, I definitely took Louisiana. I don't know. Yeah, we both did. Because I don't know anything about UTSA. So what's our, what's our record right Let's. I mean. You're winning. I'm winning. I have one, two, three, four losses. I have two. two uh, I lost Tech. I lost. I'm right now am Marshall. Two, I picked. And then I I'm picked. I'm picking four. I picked uh Did you uh, AB play yet? And then I coastal I lost. I lost three. Yeah, so and I have four. It's a seven wait. So you lost four only? Yeah. And I lost three. So I'm seven and three? Yeah. Seven and three, six and four. That's UAB didn't bad. play yet, right? What's that? UAB didn't play yet? No. Uh you oh it's canceled. Uh the Gasparilla Bowl is canceled. Why is that? COVID? Did she strike again? She's out in force. Let me see what, what happened. UAB Bowl game canceled after South Carolina backs out due to COVID. Organizer announced evening that the bowl game for has been canceled. Well, that's brutal if you're the bowl, if you're that bowl committee. For that game to have a team that you yeah. and it's not like you can find somebody to fill in. Brutal. That sucks. That does suck. All right. So that's that's uh you know, it's funny because I'm I'm looking to see if I I did watch a little bit of the Memphis game. I saw the end of the Hawaii game, but it was over. And that I Watched. I watched. I like Louisiana. They're good, but I can't believe they were beat. I can't believe UTSA can hang. I don't even know who UTSA's head coach is, but he must be pretty good. I know Larry Coker was the originator of the program. I know. I know Larry Coker from the U. Now Miami, I think, is the next game up. Right? Miami That's is playing. Trailer. Miami plays tomorrow night against Oklahoma State. Jeff Trailer. I feel like I know him. Texas guy. And Miami also, their quarterback is, uh, he said he's coming back for his senior year, King, which was not something to be expected. But I guess the way he played in his last couple games, he's obviously realizes that he's not going to go very far. So he needs another year, which is. Hey, man, the UTSA head coach gives us guys like high school coach like me and you a little hope. He was at high school. Uh, he was. Yeah, in Texas. He played at Stephen F. Austin. Okay. Which is uh, FCS? He was a high school coach as an assistant for Big Big Sandy High School in Texas for three years, then at Jacksonville High School in Texas for six years, then was a head coach at Gilmer Gilmer High School for fifteen years. Yeah, Texas high school football. He probably makes more money as a high school coach than he does at UTSA. Then then he went as a tight ends coach. Uh, then he made the move. Special teams, Texas for two years. Then assistant head coach, SMU. Assistant head coach, Arkansas for two years. Then head coach at UTSA. This is his first year. Interesting. Gilmer High School. He was the head coach. He right ready, ready for his, his winning percentage at uh, Gilmer High School? Is it nine? No, it's not nine, but it's close. High eights? Yes. 87% in 15 years. He led in the five game state championship appearance, three state titles, 12 district counts. And he was one set. And I know why he's familiar because I've probably seen his name before. 175. His record in high school was 175 and 26. Pretty good. Oh. And now he's the head coach of a Division One program. Is Gilmer High School always a power? Curious. It was if you're doing 15 seasons and you got that winning percentage. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, 
I, I, I want to know what his, uh, his, uh, um, what size school is it? That's my question. I think it's a four. And they have how many? I mean, divisions? look, they're still, let's see. They're, they're great this year. They're 14 and two. And they're still playing. No, they just lost. In what, they the, lose in the final? In, in the state championships. Yeah. At Cowboy Stadium, you ready for this? This will this will shock you. As so far they, as four? they were fourteen and one, and they played a team that was thirteen and zero. Okay, so that's a great game. Their only loss was to ah, uh, their only loss was to the team they lost to again in the state championships. You ready? You want to know what the final score was? Take a guess. Gilmer High School. 52-49. Gilmore High School scored 14 points in the state championship. Carthage, who they played. 17. 70. So there's some disparity? 70 to 14. Damn. That's craziness. Remember, they played 15-minute quarters. It's a full – like compared to us in New Jersey, that's a full yeah. quarter. Yeah. So, like, for example, like when we scored 30 points in that last – 31 points in that last game, that would be, let's see, uh, 31 divided by 4. 4 is 7 – is is basically 8 points. That would be like scoring 39, 40 points. So, if you add, like, 25% to every one of your scoring, that would be what you would have for, for the year. So, you probably – would average, yeah. Texas you know, the only state that plays 15 minute quarters. I don't know. I'm not sure. Florida doesn't. 15 minutes is a lo- like seriously. So long. If your team is playing bad, th- here's what's nice about 15 minutes. If you're a slow starting team, the truth is there's no reason for your team ever to panic. Because no, so even if you time. get down two touchdowns. In a 15 minute quarter game, that you is have so much, so time. much time. In a 12 minute game, you don't have the same amount of time. I wish we played 15 minutes. Right. Um, of course, obviously, it, it, it probably, do I know. probably increases your chances of injury, maybe, I guess. But, you know. but at that point, you're so conditioned. Yeah, you're in great shape. And then the transition to – well, that – you know, I think a lot of that has to do with the amount of players that go from high school to college out of Texas, you I mean, know? It would be – how much fun would it be to play 15-minute quarters? Oh, in high school? In oh. no huddle? That's like oh – my God. That's think about like how many more plays you get just like because of it. 40 plays. Yeah. Ew, yeah. That's – that's I like that. I like that. Defensive like coach. Amazing. So, like, yeah, defense, not so much. You can't just go and run the ball. No. Like, dive, you know, dive option the whole game. And uh, if your guys can't get – if a team, a team can adjust at halftime and then you just drop 30 on you. I love that, it. I just think it's I, – I, I think they might be the only state that does that. Mm. I'm – coach of Texas at some point in my career. Their rules are just so different, which is, you know, why you see you don't see out-of-state teams going to Texas to play. Mm. You really don't see that, you know? They keep it all very much in-state. I mean, people want to talk about compete, yet you see Florida teams going to Cali, Cali teams going to Florida, Florida, you know, Ohio travel, you know, all these other well, They also cut. They also cut. That's what I'm saying. That and that was, you know, when I was at Bosco, I said, "Why don't we go and play Texas?" And they said their rules are so different that it's just, you know, does that prepare you more, in your opinion, for college? Hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. Right. If you get a Texas player, do they cut in Florida? No, you can't. Can you cut in Georgia? I don't think you can cut anywhere else. One of the biggest adjustments as a collegiate DB was now I have to handle guys that can cut me. You know, I'm just telling you, it's a – Yeah, I know. A linebacker, that was, that was a huge issue. They would just throw – there were teams that would just throw throw at you. And you'd be like, if, you, if you're sprinting, 
Um, well, think about it, like rolling down in, 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 you know what I mean? Like you're rolling down in coverage and, or, you know, that, you're coming up on something and all of a sudden, bam, somebody gets you. Like that, when I was a fullback, just anything, chop them down. Anything on the perimeter, I just chopped them. That's and it. Then, and then it, and then a three step drop, boom, get their hands down. I just roll them right up every single That's time. It, man. And you knew going into certain weeks, like if you were playing, you know, uh, a triple option team or what, like, hey, dude, like this is, you know, they cut. Like you knew it was coming, you know. You, you used to drive there, crazy yeah. ass rush. Oh, God, bro, I'm just telling you, like it just, as a DB, like all of a sudden, all right, I'm good, you know, hey, I'm going to shed this block and boom, and now your legs are gone and you're on the ground rolling. You're like, oh. My most angry, my most angry play was even you know, when you know it's coming, it don't matter. Right, a, I would, I would say you have to practice over and over. Sweep and against Buffalo still like, doesn't matter if you practice it; it's coming. You know what I mean? Like this little short fullback, like I'm like oh, I'm running right by him, so I just try to run right by him. All of a sudden, boom, boom, and I was I'm, I I separated my I played the whole yeah. year with it, but I had like a not You're like, on the ground. Not a, the worst separation. I can't remember the grades, but but I had a separated shoulder. Yeah, and, and then you got to play the whole year with that nagging. Oh, I had to wear that like thing over you, that vest kind of thing. Yeah, you oh, had to wear a uh, shock pad. Like, yeah, couldn't lift my shoulder up. It was I played. I didn't give a. I didn't give a shit. I was playing. But, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It still creates an injury. It creates just another thing. You gotta oh, that guy chopped me. As soon as he chopped me, as soon as I – like you're going to the ground, I was like – Yeah, because you can't get your – you're like, oh, I'm going to get my hands up. This is not going to be good. This is not going to be good. Boom. I'm like, not good. And it were, and it looks even worse on film. And then your coach wants to know, why would you get cut? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, oh, you're rolling around on the ground. Yeah, he, uh, he cut me. What do you want me to do? What do you, yeah, what do you want me to do? But rules, man. I, yeah, you add another fifty, like three minutes to every quarter. Like you said, it's twelve minutes. It's a whole another quarter for us. Oh, I would love it. It would be fun, man. It would be fun as heck. As long as we're winning, it'd be fun. Well, you know, you know what it does do, like, 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 you know, some of the games it that we like, that gap when you're when you're even when you're even like an evenly matched team, and let's say you get down, right? It gives not you over, like, back. It's not. Like you could flip this now if you're if you're the a bad team playing a team much better than you, that that's probably as frustrating because you're like, oh my god, 15 minutes. I like wonder it. if they still have a I wonder if they have in place like we do though, like a 35 point running clock thing. I don't they may, but still like or is it like hey, you get up by 35, we just end the game? <laughs> <laughs> Mercy. I don't know because I How see about losing seventy to fourteen in the seventy final. What do you do there? Like keep the clock running? Ugh. I don't know. Like they lost in the state championship game seventy to fourteen. Obviously, they're a great team. Shows how good the other team is, right? <laughs> and it also shows you like how um, crazy like Texas. It, it's Texas, it, man. It could get so crazy so quick. You know what I'm saying? Well, what did you say their record was? Fifteen and two. 14 and two. So they play 16 games in Texas. Can. Yeah. The other team was 14 and no. I guess you don't have to. Okay. I don't know how they did it. And this year might be different, but either way, I mean, look at, so that's 16 games, Florida, 15 games, us 13 to win it all. And we just had that game added, you know, so it was 12 for how long? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're you're right. And if you think about it, if Texas has 15 minute quarters, right? Like, just do the math. They they play extra games just by time in general. It's amazing. So for every four games they play, you know, it's another game for us up here. You know what I mean? Because you're adding another quarter. Absolutely. So they really play like. Five, six games more than we do as a state. Absolutely. So, so um, let's uh, let's let's. Uh, there would be no one in this state that would go for that if you want. No, 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 they don't go for it. No, no. They'll, they'll safety. They'll, they'll claim some sort safety of safety issues. Uh, Haskins. Dwayne Haskins. I, I hope. I hope that. Uh, 
I hope the party was worth it, or you know, I hope that issue oh, was worth it. Was it a party, my friend. It was not a party. No longer, he is no longer today. He was waived by the Washington Football Club after you know his incident, I guess you want to call it. Um, so we all know he was he was videotaped or photographed out at a um club. I would call it a uh, with a lot of singles. A club with a lot of singles and no mask on. A, so uh, he was a he was the first round draft pick. He was supposed to be the next thing, uh, and obviously it has not worked the out. Dancing. They do the dancing. Yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that signing bonus of singles is gone, um, and now he's ultimately looking for another team. I'm sure he'll get a shot somewhere. I don't know if he's going to walk in somewhere and be somebody's starter. I don't think that's going to be. He'll have to either, you know, play backup boy and then ultimately maybe get a shot uh, somewhere. Uh, but I do not think he walks in the door or is signed somewhere to be somebody's starter. It is maturity. That, that's basically what shows a lack of maturity. Um, I mean, on a lot of levels. You're on the, you're in the spotlight at a just mega high level. You, you were first round draft pick, and um, and there has been questions about him. Not like uh, I don't remember. If, I don't remember if the questions were around the, how hard he works or his like demeanor. But there were some. I, I can't remember now. In the draft, there were some questions about him. I can't remember exactly what it was because he had a, obviously a, a sick senior year. Did you see? Uh, you know his stats. Well, his stats his senior year were wild, bonkers. But but the, uh, um, but there were a lot of questions about him. I can't remember what. Well, here's the thing, too. Like, it's not. I don't think it's that type of situation. Like, the whole maturity thing goes into more so even maturity. even even more so the fact of you. Like, look, yeah, yeah, you're in the NFL. Yeah, you're a quarterback. Yeah, you're oh. in the high spotlight. But look, man. Like, how about responsibility and maturity throughout? the situation that's going on now, like you're not supposed to be asked or, or, you know, you're not supposed to be out without a mask, putting people in jeopardy. You're doing that. And then here's the part that gets me. Your coach has just gone through how many weeks of chemotherapy treatment mm. and you're still going to do that. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. You're right. He's very selfish. Like, like I understand you want to go out and have a good time, my man, but look, dude, like, and I mean, he was a named the captain of the team, you know, like I get it, bro. But look, that hits home for me because now like on a personal level, I'm not only am I, you, you're talking about it, like, look, it's one thing if you want to go out and do this and then hang around your teammates and stuff like that. But if you have respect for your coach, not only as your coach, but as a human being that could be at a very high risk and you've seen it played out. I mean, you're talking about this guy getting chemotherapy in the morning, throwing up in the afternoon, and then coming to practice still, and you're going to go out and do that? Come on, bro. Like, it's not cool, man. You know? It's just not It's not the right mindset that I want a guy who's supposed to be the leader of my team, who I'm going to supposed to, you know, depend on in key situations. You're going to go and do that, and then I'm going to, you know, expect you to perform for me? No, thank Nah, dude. Like, listen, good luck. Good luck elsewhere because, you know, this, that's not the type of person I want here. And I'm sure Rivera said that, you know, look, it's only his first year there. He's trying to create a culture. Is that the guy he wants to lean on? No, thanks. Mm. Not to mention your play hasn't lived up to shit. So, <laughs> you know. Well, that's right. If you play, look, uh, what is it? Winning winning cures all. Like maybe if you won some games for us, like, you know, maybe some of this stuff could be brushed under. But, dude, you're doing all this stuff on top of not winning? No, thanks. Yeah, I, I, you know, he only threw five touchdowns, seven or so. I, I, I just feel like he just, I don't know. Like, I, I he's one of those guys who's not going to get it until it's, it's all, it's right. yeah. It, 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 and, and like I said, he, well, he's not a, he's not a drop down. This is the what's going on. You know, okay, I know he can win me games, but we deal with not, he doesn't run at all. So he's not even like he's not even performing on the field to the level that was expected. So right. sorry, bro. Next yeah. up, like, and look, look, you're talking about a team in Washington that's willing to go with a quarterback who almost lost his leg 
instead of you. You know what I mean? Like, well, there's a lot to be said for that guy, but uh, but here's the thing: you know, and I think ultimately Alex Smith knows he's not a long term answer. He knows he's got maybe one year of maybe maybe one year of being a starter, right. and then be a backup for my last few years, and then ride the thing out. You know what I'm saying? I think he understands that. He's mature enough to know that, right? So now, you know, Washington is like. All right, well, what do we do? All right, well, you know what? This guy was a question mark. He hasn't checked any of these boxes. Let's move on. All right, see you later. So now, you know, where do they go? I don't know where they are in the draft. Um, I know they possibly could make the playoffs with certain scenarios that could, that are going on this weekend, which, you know, the NFC East is just a total shit show as far as teams and whatnot, and especially this weekend, what's going on. I mean, you got three teams that could make the playoffs just based off what happens, which is amazing. A absolutely. No doubt about it. And to be in that whatever and them to say, you know what? Nah, let's step aside. Let's cut ties right now so that we don't have to deal with it. Because there's going to be, you know, there's going to be quarterbacks that are out there. Um, and then obviously with the draft and whatnot, because you, you got, you know, five quarterbacks that are easily draftable guys that could be, you know, guys in the NFL. But I, I credit <laughs> Washington, to be honest, you know, making a move saying, you know what? That's it, bro. Gone. See ya. Absolutely. No doubt. Um, what was I going to say? Well, so so much for that playoff playoff situation. So, uh, two things. Did you see um, JJ Watt's statement? Phenomenal. So, should we read it? Can read you play it? it? I, uh, uh, was it was it audio or was that? It was his. It was his post. It was his post game presser. Okay. All right. So let me see what see if I can. It went viral, and I mean, look, I I've liked JJ Watt from the jump. I think his story, uh, how good he is in general, the way he carries himself, you know, the family itself, you know, I, I just think he's a great NFL story, somebody to look up to, and somebody to do that. So for him to come out and say these things when you know he is so frustrated, I mean, and you're talking, this is a defensive player of the year guy here, you know, and for him to make these statements, I think a lot of people pay attention working in the building, go out to the practice field and work hard, do your lifts and do what you're supposed to do. You should not be here. This is a job. We are getting paid a whole lot of money. There are a lot of people that watch us and invest their time and their money into buying our jerseys and buying a whole bunch of, and they care about it. They care every single week. We're in week 16 and we're four and 11. And there's fans that watch this game that show up to the stadium that put in time and energy and effort and care about this. So if you can't go out there and you can't work out, you can't show up on time, you can't practice, you can't want to go out there and win, you shouldn't be here because this is a privilege. It's the greatest job in the world. You get to go out and play a game. And if you can't care enough, even in week 17, even when you're trash, when you're four and <laughs> if you can't care enough to go out there. He tells it like it is. Artist, that's bullshit. So let's, let's, let's cut it right there because you know how the, uh, the internet police – they, they they uh all of a sudden our 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 video will be um uh demonetized and not that it matters so we don't get money from it but but uh uh not shared as much um so what was gonna say so so your thoughts no I, I, look I love guys that ultimately call out like. The, the, JJ Watts, your ultimate definition of a pro in my eyes, right? He, 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 he worked his way to get where he is. He worked his way to be the best he can be. He constantly is working. He knows he has just, he plays, he plays and works and carries himself with a chip on his shoulder. Like, you know, look, there's always somebody who could outwork me. And that's what his staple and his groundwork has been on is like, I'm going to put the work in and I'm going to put myself in a good position. He worked his way to defensive player of the year. And look, he's doing everything possible to be great. Now, football, the ultimate team game, doesn't really matter what you do, JJ, because you can be the best at your position and your team could still be over, kind of like they are now. The Texans are not very good. So what he's saying here is he's basically calling out and saying, look, if, if you can't come to the stadium or you can't do your job, if you can't lift, if you can't do the work that entails being, you know, an NFL football player, then you shouldn't be here. 
And I love it because he's calling out guys. Because look, we know how it is. There are guys that just try and slide by, especially at a team like the Texans that got four wins. You know, they're terrible. Like he said, they're trash. And you still have people that are buying your jersey that are coming up to him and saying, look, man, we still believe in you. Keep fighting. You know, we're here with you no matter what. And then for these guys to basically chalk it up and and just go out there and kind of do whatever and not play or work to their maximum ability, it's a total disservice to the fans. And I think, you know, this statement coming from him is, is huge. I wish more pros thought that way. Yeah, I mean, I – there's a couple of things. So, so some, first of all, the team is a train wreck since they fired their coach um, in the middle of the season. Uh, uh, the interim coach is not, knows he's not going to be the head coach. Correct. Um, it, they, there's a lot to this whole thing. So they're basically all just biding their time. So the question then begs like, you know, what are they doing to motivate their team? Like, What's going on there from a leadership standpoint up top? Like, I, I, I don't know. Here's, uh, here's and, and my they're thing. Just ride, obviously, they're just riding the, 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 the time um, until, until – Two weeks left. Yeah. Or one week, right? This is the last, last regular season game this weekend? Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I, think, I think that part's crazy. Yeah. Right? If you're in the NFL and you have to be motivated, there's a problem. Right, but there are guys that have to be motivated, and I explained to you I know. I know. my my uh, my old uh, DC had spoke about it at length from college, and and he spoke about how sometimes you have guys that are worried about you know how many followers they have on Twitter, just, and and to me, I know I know I get it. It's just so I, hard. I someone I, I someone who just like listen like why do you care if I, you're a pro? Like you are playing a game. You are you are more money. Like it, it, it has favorite. nothing to even do with the money. You know how many people would do what you do for free? I I I have a news flash for NFL players, just in case they weren't sure if they're doing it for clout or if they're doing it because they like to get more girls that want to date you. I just want you to know that all you have to do is just go up to him and say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I, uh, I play for the so-and-so and you'll probably find yourself a date that simple. So just so you know, and then if it's clout, like, I don't understand what cl clout it's fake. It's fake clout. Like those people don't care about you. How about just doing what you're supposed to do so you can advance your own success, your own career. And it's going to set you up like let's say you're not even let's say you're 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 a starter in the NFL, okay, and you're a, a, a good player, but you're not like special, quote unquote. You're not the best. If you do a great job and you have a, a solid career, every next thing you go into is going to be exponentially more successful for you. And if playing in the NFL. Is like now you obviously have to work hard to get there, and obviously most of to get there, almost everybody works really, really hard. I'm talking about once you get there, and I think the majority of them do, but the ones that don't, don't you realize that you have the golden ticket to do whatever you want going forward? All you have to do is act like a professional for the time you're in the pros. You want to go coach? You're probably going to have a good opportunity to go coach. You want to start a business? You probably have some capital behind you to go. I would it. think so. <laughs> Put capital behind you. Do you, if it, uh, do you want to go in corporate? Uh, okay. I played in the NFL for 10 years. Do you think that someone's going to bring you in to sell products for them? Yes. There's so many avenues for you. It's craziness that they would ever run the risk of doing like, I know they're young. Guess what? No one else gets a lottery ticket. No one. God gave you gifts. You utilize your gifts. You should be. It's commendable that you've done the things to get yourself there. Now keep advancing it because 
30 years from now, you're going to be in positions. What I used to say to players I represent, that if you make it, even if you don't become a star, okay, because I had a lot of the free agent guys. Right. If you get th- just say three years of salary, okay, that's like $1.8 million, all right? $1.8 million as a head start in life, that's like getting you having your own venture capital firm to do whatever you want in life. Literally, literally. Like people who in business, they go, hey, I'd like to get funding of a million dollars. They got to go beg venture capitalists to do it. You already have the cash to put into whatever it is you want to do. I mean, you want to start a gym and be a trainer? You'll be able to pay the $30,000 out of your checkbook to start a business. What don't they don't get about it? How does people not understand that? It is not an excuse anymore to say, I come from XYZ background. Everybody in the world has Google. Everyone. How much money do you need to do this? Everyone has YouTube. Everyone. People who are homeless can go to the library and access the internet. No excuse. I love it. I love it. You know, it's, uh, I just don't understand. Like some of these guys, it's like, you know, how many people would just, you just got to ask yourself a question. Like, and this is how I would go to work every day. Like how many people would kill to be in my shoes? How many people would do what I'm doing right now for free? You know, like you're in the NFL, dude, a game, you get to play a game for fun. I could tell well, you that not that many would kill to do what you do for what you do. I could tell you that as a, a coach, we enjoy it. We personally enjoy it. Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking in general. Like if I was, I'm talking as an NFL player. Yes. Yes. Almost everyone would, right. would, would kill to be in that position. Even people who know nothing or have, have a quarter of the passion, you know, if for no other reason other than, Let's let's say something that's even like football. You're getting a paycheck to do something that's fun, right? I mean, people have to go work at Walmart and and, and, and pump gas, and and there's nothing wrong with those jobs. But the truth is, very few people say my goal is to be the cashier checkout person at Walmart or to pump gas. Those people are doing what they have to do to succeed in life given the situation they have the fact that they throw it away that, that, that now most of them don't, but the fact that there are people that will throw it away, given, given the gifts they have is bonkers to me. No one wants your clothing line, play football and make money. Be they really good. Money. How about you focus on what you're supposed well, to be? Unless you're on. LeBron or, you know, you, uh, uh, um, look, why don't that time you're spent marketing your clothing line? Why don't you go live? Players, yes, people, the investment you want to put in into your clothing line, why don't you go invest in it in it in a hyperbaric chamber to sleep in, or a float tank, or acupuncture, or taking care of your body to get two or three more years at the craft that you are meant to do. God put you on this earth to be a football player. Go be the best damn football player and don't allow anything to come in between that. How about this? I don't understand this. You're an NFL player. I used to say this to guys. They all want to run a football camp that somebody else runs for them. They get half the money. Why don't you set it up yourself with your own personnel around you? And then you cut the cost and you make more money. (laughs) Why not open a training facility and start training athletes with your name and get people underneath you? And then you don't have to hire anybody. You just get coaches that could do and implement, uh, come up with a little system. What made you great? Something made you great. Something I can't see myself. There's, there's a quote that some coach said to you. Put it on a T-shirt. For I mean, look at this. I can't. I mean, I, I can't. I, 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 I got to get a studio for God's sakes. My lighting's terrible. You can have <laughs> lighting. You can have proper lighting on your media stuff. All right, I yelled. That's enough. Um, that's my rant for the day. 
That that might be uh, yeah. Anyway, you guys I look. I, I look, we are both on the same page. I understand it. It's just it's so frustrating when you see guys, you know, like like a Dwayne Haskins who has you know everything under the sun. You know, like I always say, he's got the keys to the Lamborghini, and he you know he's gonna go and he's gonna put freaking you know regular gas in it. Like, you know what I mean? Like I don't understand some of these guys, man. Like. You have every opportunity under the sun to be great and do great things. And, and that, that's what the great ones are all about. Like, like a JJ Watt, man. And this is the fact that he has to call guys out publicly at a presser sucks. Yeah. And you know, I'm not a huge fan of the calling out part. Um, and it's obviously a little bit of frustration, Oh, it's got to. I mean, look. Does does anyone like, want to? And especially because they lost this game this weekend that they probably uh, weren't supposed to lose. He see guy. He sees guys cashing it in, and he knows that. Look, he doesn't have that many seasons left. This one's already a wash. So, you, like you said, the frustration is obviously bubbling out. And look, I'm not a fan of probably calling out to your teammates too. Like my thing is like. Uh, did he say that to his teammates first? Right, uh, right, 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 right. Now, I would have hoped that he would have expressed that in the locker room and then went to the presser. Or did he just – look, I, I, I don't think he's a guy that's, that's not going to say that in the locker room. I don't think he's one of those guys that just put it out publicly and not say something on the uh, in the locker room itself. I think he's a guy that probably addresses his teammates. And look – I'm very much one of those guys that look, you want to do you, bro, go ahead, but I'm going to do me. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I think it just kind of boiled over for him. And it's like, he had to say something at this point. I don't think he's going to be a Texan very long anyway. I don't know. Uh, well, maybe not. I mean, I guess after this, maybe not. I, I, I think that, um, God, I'd love to see him go somewhere yeah. and, and, and actually have an opportunity to play in the playoffs. All right, positive NFL playoff picture. Let's get some positive. I'm getting irritated. All right. <laughs> um, How about this? Let's let's do this one. NFL MVP. Okay. Uh, I'll be honest. After think? last night, I think Aaron Rodgers has locked it up. Who won last year, Mahomes? I think Mahomes could win it every year. Is uh Aaron Rodgers throwing for however many? I, I, I got I got a couple of candidates. So, uh, all right, I'll give you some names and wait. Tell me what you think. Um, uh, Josh Allen. No, not yet. The eleven and three. Um, Derrick Henry. No. I think it's between Aaron Rodgers. And what about um, Russell Wilson? Baker Mayfield? Hell no. Did you see that game yesterday? No. I don't care how many receivers went out the day before with COVID. You're saying Aaron Rodgers is 11, 12 and 3, number one team in the NFC. Best year he's had. Well, it's. And I would of- not want to play Green Bay in the playoffs. Tom Brady? Absolutely not. I think that's about it. I, I mean, now here's I, the thing: this is a regular season award, correct? You know, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure. But I, I think I, I think it's coming down to Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, and Aaron Rodgers. Seattle's eleven to four. All right. So, who do you think has the so? In the AFC, the the big four are KC, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Tennessee. Wait, what? So AFC, hang on. So AFC, you have um, the Chiefs, Chiefs, Steelers, Buffalo, Titans, Dolphins, Steelers. Let's do top fours: KC, Steelers, Buffalo, and who? Titans, I guess Titans and Dolphins are, um, are pretty. I mean, they're all ten and five. I mean, so was the, so was the the Browns and the Colts. The, NF- the NFC, you have you have Packers, Saints, Green Bay, Packers, Saints, Seahawks, Washington Football Saints. Team, 
because I guess that comp. From- they're in the begin. They're in the division. They went in the the division. Crap. There's crying going on upstairs. I don't know why. Tampa so Bay. This is crazy. There could be a ten win team in the NFC that doesn't get in because the NFC East it, it gets a team in and they're so bad. Hmm. Like, look, if the Giants I, win, I'll give you my. I'll give you my pick. I I, I think KC and either. I mean, a KC. The I think Bills, the Steelers could be a first round exit. The Bills, um, or the Titans. I like the Bills. I, I think, think the Titans are always going to be in the mix because I think when you have a running back like that, you're going to be able. And I know a Vrabel coach team is going to play defense. My sleeper team. My sleeper team is the Saints. I think the Steelers are kind of a sleeper, even though they're twelve and three. Because I am not they, a Big Ben fan. Yeah, I don't think they're. I mean, they, they're playing. They played. They were playing great in the NFC. Green Bay, the Saints are good. Seattle's good. I like the, the Saints, man. And I like and I the. Bucks, think the I like the Bucks. Bucks. You do like the Bucks. I I just think these guys. I like so the Bucks because they play defense. He's got so many weapons, though. Not even that. I think just him and Gronk having been there so many times, I think adds a whole other element once they get to the playoffs. But, like, how do you stop all of those, like you said, all those weapons? Yeah, I don't know. about Tom Brady, Gronk, Goodwin, Antonio Brown, Mike Evans, Fournette in the backfield. Like, what are you doing? Who are you going to stop? And they play defense. And they get to play in warm weather. Yeah. I don't but know. I think the Saints are my sleeper going in, especially after Kimura's. Did you see that performance Six this weekend? Touchdowns by an, uh, touchdowns? Ernie Nevers record? No. Now here's my here's my question. Ernie Davis or Ernie Nevers? You saw, you saw at the end of the game where they put him in to get another touchdown, right? Um... No, I didn't see that. So this was a question like, oh, that's, you know, whatever. You're trying to show up the other team. Here's my take on it. You've put yourself in that position. This guy's got five touchdowns on the day with an opportunity to make history. And you're going to hold him out. Why? Because you don't want to look bad on the other coach. That other coach should be signaling to the other sideline saying, put him in if you want. Like, we haven't stopped him yet. Why should we now? Put him in the damn game and let him get a cool record. Yeah, you know, in the NFL, I have no problem with it. It's the NFL. I mean, come on. Yeah, so, there's never. Listen, nobody's gonna. Do that you're, you're in the NFL, dude. You, you get paid millions of dollars. Uh, you're gonna, act, you're gonna act like one of us in high school who get paid uh, dollars. I mean, come on, give me a break. Now, the NFL, you're getting paid millions. You're gonna cry because someone runs a score up on you. <laughs> Not even running him up. The guy's about to break a major record, man. Like that'll never. That's a record that won't be touched, like ever. Now, what I didn't know is Kamura was an Alabama guy. He went to Tennessee. I thought. I thought he was an Alabama guy, dude. No, University of Tennessee. No, Alvin Kamara, University of Tennessee. I'm pretty sure, but you know, I. Like as I like to say, I've been wrong before, and I will be wrong again. But we can look it up. We can fact. Because I'm pretty sure at one point, maybe he ended there. Oh, oh, oh I don't know if he went there first. Because I, I, I want to say there was a picture of warmups, Alabama, and you got running backs like the dude that's there now. I could Warren Kamora, and then Henry. And another back, and you're like, whoa, <laughs> like, um, like this is these are the guys that are there. Like, he played with Tennessee. It says here. Okay. Say, oh, you all, oh, you're you're not wrong. Yes. Okay, here we go. Kamara's short time at the University of Alabama was a rough experience. He had knee surgery during preseason 
then redshirt as a true freshman when he was unable to break into a recruitment class that featured future running backs Derrick Henry, TJ Yeldon, and Kenyon Drake. Is that crazy? That's what I'm saying. There's a picture of those four. In They've been banned Kamara from practicing with the team and suspended him from their bowl game. He went to Hutchinson Community College and rushed for 1,200 yards, 18 touchdowns, then 1,469 yards and 21 touchdowns, and then he went to the University of Tennessee for two years. Whereupon he didn't do that much. Where was it? Kamara, Henry, Yeldon, and who was the other one? Kenyon Drake. It is. Now, here's another thing. Three, the quarterback that's there now at Alabama. What's his name? Quarterback now at Alabama? Yeah. Um, oh, what's his name? Because there's an awesome picture of warm-ups for Alabama, and you have – Mac Jones? Yes. Is that him? To right now is quarterback, Mac Jones. So you have Jones, Jalen Hurts, and Tua. <laughs> Right? Bonkers. And Bonkers. that's like, you know, and those are the guys that you have in pre, like, kind of like the, the, the picture that was, you know, flying around a couple years ago where you had, you know, when the guys were, when they were all at Ohio State, you know, you had Burrow, you had Fields, and then you had, you know, whoever their starter was. Like, and it was like, really? Like, these are the backups? <laughs> So who who do you predict will be in the final? Do you have a uh, – I guess we could wait on that. Why don't we do Heisman pick? All right, Heisman pick. Sure, we could do that. Who do you like? You saw you saw the guys that were up for – that are got invited, right? No, I did not. Tell me. Okay, so the Heisman guys are uh, Jones from Bama, the receiver from Bama, Well, well, they say that's the favorite, the receiver from Bama. Was it Smith? Um, yeah, he's the favorite. Uh, Is that his name? No, I'm not sure. I've, I've, uh, um, what's his name from Clemson? He's not going to win. Is Mac, jo- Is Mac Jones a candidate? I, I think it's the. I think it's. I think the order will be the Bama court. Uh, the I think the Bama kid will win it. The receiver. So Mac Jones, Trevor Lawrence, Kyle Trask, Devonta Smith. Devonta Smith is the favorite. What is it, Devonta Smith? I think. I think. Who do I think? Sh- I think Devonta Smith should win it. And I think ultimately does. You're going to say that he should, but won't. I think Lawrence finishes second. I think uh, Trask third and Jones fourth. All right, let me see. Let me see. let me just get Devonta Smith's numbers. Devonta Smith's numbers are stupid. I think he's got like 109 catches, a punt return for a touchdown. Oh yeah, he's a bullet, Devonta Smith. Um, I just wanted to refresh myself here. 98 catches, 100. Bama, Bama, Clemson, and Florida. So three SEC schools and an ACC. Nine, 98 catches, 1,511 yards, 17 touchdowns. Eight punt returns, 199, one touchdown. It's great numbers. I think if Trevor Lawrence didn't get COVID, he'd win it. He would have won it, yeah. He hasn't I, won it yet, has he? No. I think this is his first invite, isn't it? Okay. What are Mac Jones' numbers? Remember, Mac who's voting on Uh wow. Mac Jones is pretty damn good numbers, too. Uh I would say. Five touchdowns in the, in the championship. It's tough. 
19 touchdowns. I, yeah, I mean, 32 touchdowns thrown. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I, I'd i say that even though his numbers are really, really good, I think Devonta Smith's going to win and uh, probably has the best overall numbers. The second best numbers are probably Mac Jones or Kyle, Kyle Trask maybe even. But I, I just don't know you know the loss. I I, I think if Al, the Alabama do they split our, our votes end up getting split by this you know situation? Does that give Trevor Lawrence a, a better chance? Kyle Trask's numbers four thousand yards passing, forty three touchdowns, and he's rushed for he's rushed for. Wait a few touchdowns. He's rushed for uh, Trevor Lawrence. Let me see. That starts, of course, yeah. with the letter J. Matt. All right. So, I don't know. I think Devonta Jones wins it. I think second is Trevor Lawrence. I agree. I think third will be Kyle Trask, and fourth will be Mac Jones. Yep. So, we got the same order. Oh, is that what you said? Okay, good. Yep. Same thing. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I was just... trying to figure out my stats here to try. I was trying to do my analysis. So we're we're exactly the same. Cool. All right. Um, and who votes on that? Press. Uh, the Heisman, Heisman Pass Trophy winners, and then everyone who's past winners. I'm assuming it's mostly press. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Ah, the secrets out. Yep. They released it today. Uh, great, awesome. great, um, awesome. Great, great post by them, though. Yeah, I love it. I think it's awesome, man. Mm. You know, I, I, I think that's a like to. I wonder if they do that individually for each kid. I think that's phenomenal. Should we tell our viewers what the hell we're talking about? Super one hundred, top hundred players. It's a great graphic, man. And I love that picture. That Buck Burgundy looks good, man. So for all of you that don't know, the uh, New Jersey Football Coaches Association puts out a Super 100 All-State team every year as voted on by uh, coaches um, throughout the state for uh, obviously a Super 100 team within the state. And uh, and our guy Owen Lachlan got named to it, which is to be named one more time. Graphic. Yeah, and so I said it's a great. Um, so if you go and follow them on Twitter, New Jersey Co uh, NJCFA, right? NJCFA, uh, New Jersey Coaches Football Association. Uh, they put out a great graphic and you know tagged him up in it and whatnot. And, you know, we've said all year that he deserves everything he's got and, and whatnot. And you know, he's gonna continue his career with his brother at Richmond, and uh, he'll be a spider. So, uh, you know, kudos to him. It's, you know, in, in only six games, the kid put up some daunting numbers and whatnot. But uh wish he would have had more. But, you know, he'd been a pleasure to coach for the last two years. Um, good kid on and off the field. And, you know, pray that his brother hits a growth spurt so we can do some things with his little brother. <laughs> he will. But good, uh, it's it's awesome. It really is. I mean, top 100 players. How many, how many football players in New Jersey? 100. <laughs> no, I said how how many how many senior football players do you think in general? Oh, 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 I oh how many senior players? I wasn't uh um 1000? I, I don't I don't know. I'd have to look at that. So Either I'm not, way, you named that so i am way, you named as one of the top 100 players in the state. Great honor. It's a it's a cool it's a cool well this year we did the meeting um uh, via, uh, and like I said in my tweet, I think it's awesome for me to, you know, I was named to that team as a player when I was in high school. So that fact that I get to now coach guys that are, you know, being brought, you know, or, or being coming part of that brotherhood of that stuff that, you know, stays with us for as long as we can, as long as we are, you know, once you're named to that team, your name's on that team forever. So I think that's, that's one of the coolest aspects of, you know, having the ability to now coach these guys that are getting named to teams that I was named to. It's, it's pretty cool. You know, I don't even know if they had that back when you were playing, probably not. Right. I know. Cause it was relatively, I think new thing, um, 2000 stuff like that. 
Yeah, I don't, I, um, I don't think they had it, but um, but it's definitely it, cool. It's a, it's in, yeah, it's it's a great honor. I mean, it's uh, uh, two years back to back. We've had guys there, so that's um, and that's the goal, man. It's like, look, we want to win wins and losses and all that. You know, stuff is huge. State championships are huge, but you know, if we can start, you know these guys deserve accolades and whatnot. It's part of, you know, what football is. And if we can get guys to continue to be on these teams and move forward, like, you know, that's a big part of it, you know, big part of it. And these kids deserve the recognition they put in the work, you know what I mean? Um, and ultimately most of the guys that are on these teams put in the work, you know, they didn't just get there because somebody likes who they are. Um, and I guess two years running, two years, we've been there two years. We got guys on this team. That's huge. Yeah, that it, it, he did a great job. So fun. It's a, it's a great meeting when when, when I'm on it with all the co the uh, coaches. They break you up by region, and yeah. you go through it. It's really cool. It's um, uh, it, it's it's fun because they go through each player and 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 they talk about them and uh, uh, the guys that are obviously you, you find out all the guys that are going on to big time levels and stuff. So it's cool. Very cool. Having guys on there two years in a row is a great thing. Um, I, I, I wish they would have told us the day they were going to do it so I could have been aware. But yeah. maybe they – I mean, it's not not the uh, meeting, but um, the award. So that uh, you could have – Yeah, so I could have been looking out for it. But, hey, that's not here or there. At least they get – the graphic looks nice, really nice. It's cool. Really cool stuff, so – um. Uh, it it's uh, it's cool. I like that they're getting like into like more of the uh, the. We need to do more of that social media stuff for the players. Like that's part of improving. And that's where your view, and like that's where you know you've impressed that on me. Whereas you know just because of you understand the importance of that in that retrospect. Whereas, you know, that was, I didn't really ever see the impact that it has to a level. Um, so you've really opened my eyes since I've been working with you more so as to how that absolutely can help, you know, not only an individual, but a program itself. Um, because that's what these guys want to see nowadays, man. It's just like the same conversation we just had about NFL guys that are in it for how many followers they have or how many likes or brands or any of that type of stuff, you know, like, the world gets their information through social media now. That's where stuff comes out. That's where it needs it needs to be, you know, put forth. So that's exactly right. I'm uh, tagging him right now. Uh, oh, he's gonna be all juiced up. I bet you his brother didn't get that one. He's got one up on his brother for that one. Now, now, now we got a little pressure on Mr. Grassi. That's it, bro. You got to be uh, I mean, to get in there. We got a couple of candidates that could possibly get on there, you know, oh, depending yeah. on the years yeah. these guys have. Ian, Ian's going to be definitely uh, – uh, um, But we're talking about – yeah, you're right. Right. You're right. right. We're talking about we're talking about our Red Bank stuff. We're, we're, let's finish up uh, – that we should have the Red Bank show. We can talk about our players. Ooh. I told you that's something you need to do next year. Yeah. The, Dave, the, Dave Schumann, the Dave Schumann Buck Hour. Buck hour, yeah. Every Tuesday night for an hour. Show, you, get, you get you get in with the uh, you get a little you know we'll get you a little buck studio show. with some buck gear around you and do your hour long show every week. The Buck Hour with Dave Schumann, head coach of Red Bank Regional Football, and here we go. Talk about the game the week before, the upcoming opponent, anything going on. The Buck Hour. Absolutely. I can, I, can, I can't find Jack Chain. Uh, uh, I can't find his uh, Twitter. What is it? I don't know. Yeah. You might have one of those weird ones. Let me see. Right. Like, I score touchdowns or at, something? Uh, at JS Chamberlain 7. Oh, that's it. At JS. That, that's right. I always used to have a problem with that last year. JS Chamberlain. There he is. I always love when these guys have been out of the program for an entire year and they still have their Red Bank picture up. It's it's uh what do we call it? What, what do we call it? Red Bank is uh is a QB, QBU. <laughs> we get three in three years. 
That's what I'm calling a QBU. <laughs> anyway, um, I was there. Any, there was something else I felt like there, that was a big story. I can't remember what it was. Um. Oh, the, did we talk about the LSU head coach naming? No, we did, not. We did briefly say who, who the that lead candidate was. Um. Not LSU. I'm sorry. Did I say LSU? I mean um, Auburn. Auburn. Uh, head coach. So Auburn had this wild coaching search that ended in Brian Harson from Boise State. And there's a lot like – the guys had an incredible record at Boise. So, I know, And I didn't know this either. He was a former quarterback at Boise. Okay. And one of the articles I read was that he had gone through either three or four coaches, head coaches in his time at Boise. So that was something in one of his first, in his first meeting with the Auburn players that he spoke to them about was like, look, I understand where it, where you're coming from. Like I've been in your shoes. Um, so I think that they said was a huge, like, grabbed the team and the team was like, Oh, okay. Like eye opening. Cause he said, you know, he, he, he was like, most of these guys don't know who the hell I am. They may have heard of Boise state, but they never, they don't know who I am, you know? Um, but listen, it, 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 I think it's a safe hire. It's not the splash. I think they were looking for, but I think he's going to get the job done. The question is, does he keep steel on? Um, when I bet you a lot of those players were hoping Steele got the job. Well, that happens a lot when you, you know, especially now you're concerned about change. I think you keep that guy in place. I don't know. I don't know on that. I think you got, I don't know if he knows him and he, and, and they have a relationship. You know how that, and you know, that's how that works. If not, if he doesn't, have a relationship, Steele, I might want to personally, if I, if I have a meeting with him, and we sit Why down. You bring your and own right vibe. I'm going to keep him for she, like he's been a defensive coordinator in this league for how long? He knows the league. He might be the best guy for the job. Who's this? Steel. Wait, wait, wait. Re- rephrase that. Say say what you just said again. So I'm saying if I sit, if I'm if I'm Harson coming in, and okay. I sit down with Steel, and okay. we vibe, right? You're not going to vibe if unless you know him. How do you know that? It's, you how? It, uh, all right, let me play like this. The def, if, if is he an offensive guy, Harrison? First of all, I don't. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I would assume so. He's a coy. Was a quarterback. So okay, okay, all right. So your defensive guy has to be someone that you trust implicitly. I think the mistake that a lot of offensive guys make, and we we played it last week. Did we play it with uh, Arizona State? What uh, Herm Edwards said, or no? Did we play that, or we just retweeted it? No, we might have just retweeted it. So Herm Edwards says something really interesting. He's like, "You might coach the side of the ball. That's like your, but the head coach, you're in charge of the offense, the defense, the special teams. You're in charge of the whole entire program. So it." it even if you're not calling the plays on offense, you're in charge. You're the head coach of all of that stuff. Right. And your job to make sure all of it works for all the players on the team. So I think the defensive coordinator has to be somebody that um, completely fits with what you want to do. Because at Auburn, the last thing you want is – some sort of internal strife. And the players that are there currently are going to have to get used to him. Now, if they keep Steele, then it's because he has has met him and he has met him. He has some level of relationship with him. If he's going in blind, I think that's the biggest mistake that a college coach can make is hire someone they don't really know for for a offensive or defensive coordinator position um and even i i would even say argue the same thing as special teams but special teams you you're more likely to be able to take someone in that has a an expertise there and is really good there because they're playing with all the players from all the different teams 
So, and he's not having an input uh, on on culture as much as he's implementing your philosophy on special teams. But I offensive, and I think you need all three to be guys that are are your guys. And my guess is that if he does is that he's going to try and bring a guy in from Boise. Now, I don't know. Did Boise hire one of his assistants? I would uh, I would think if you're taking that job, I'm not taking that job unless I have the ability to hire my people, right? Right. Well, he's definitely going to hire his – he's definitely not taking the job without hiring his people. I was just wondering if Boise was looking at one of his guys for the head job. It looks like no. So it looks like Boise is looking at – You know, up and comers. I don't even know the name any of these guys. So the head coach of Montana State, the um, right. So they're going to look to go. You know, Kelly they're gonna Moore, Kelly Moore from uh, from the Cowboys, the OC. Yeah, who played there? Who played there? That might be. A, that's that might be the best. I think that's the best way to go. That's probably where they'll go. Um, and then hire a guy who's an alum, who's an up and comer. Get him cheap. Right. And hope he wants to ride out his entire career there. Then the other guy is they have an oh, Oregon, I guess, defensive coordinator also played at Boise. So those are actually three good choices. If it was me, I would take Kellen Moore, but that's, yeah. I'm not, I, I don't know anything about him. So uh, I'm just going on paper. Um, but the guy who's been the Cowboys head coach, probably going to be a uh, uh, pretty darn good. <clears throat> so, um, what was I going to say? Uh, um, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, yeah, I think that would be the, the best hire for. Well, I always, I always like the idea of hiring staff. guys. Don't you think he's just going to bring his staff? Uh, you would think most most of them that are willing to come. Now, I guess, I guess, if they knew Kellen Moore was like, it depends on who's an alumni and who's not. Saying, like, look, look, if I if I coached Kellen, and now he's coming back, you know, one obviously you got to see if he's willing. You know, can I stay if he comes back? All right, here is uh, defensive coordinator. So, Harson. Oh, Harson, maybe. Oh, okay. Okay, so number one on his list is the defensive coordinator for Oregon, for Auburn. Okay. He's a Boise guy. The second Boise alum is Gerald Alexander from the Miami Dolphins. And then the third guy, who actually I know this guy. I feel like he's recruited a player that I've uh, coached, uh, but I don't remember. Or maybe he's been, you know, Jeff Schmetting, who's the Boise State co-defensive coordinator. Um, he is his current uh, DC. Then they have see what you said, Steele, but there doesn't seem to be uh, any relationship there. And then Will Muschamp, who was at Auburn with um, Gus, right? Malzahn. I don't believe that's going to happen, though. No, I think that's too big of a name to bring in at that. You know. I think it's either going to be. It ends up that your defensive coordinator is now a bigger name than your head coach. Yeah, I think. Well, that's okay. It, de it depends on. I, I, I. That's okay if. But not in that case with that guy. In that case. If it's Nick Saban, yeah. You know, Nick Saban could care less. If it's, uh, um, what's his name in North Carolina? Um Matt, like guys, Matt Brown, Matt Brown, guys have established themselves. I, I, I think another, uh, um, you know, Shiano, guys who like really are seasoned coaches, bringing in a guy who was a head coach could be very helpful for them. Um, like if, like, like I could see, like, like say PJ Fleck doesn't work out at Minnesota, Shiano bringing him back to Rutgers, <coughs> which I can't believe that that could possibly be the case, but it could. <coughs> I think it looks it kind of looks that way. Yeah, you know, and especially trying to you know keeping him in the Big Ten. 
You know, I think it's interesting. Having been to Minnesota and seen the facilities, which are, by the way, I mean, obviously other places are great too. Mind blowing. But um, I wonder, you know, is there, is there something, you know, like PJ Fleck, I, having watched his offense. I He's think, a great point, man. Is he a very good X and O guy? I feel like they could do better offensively than they are. Like, I feel like they could be a little more wide open. I, I would yeah. expect a high energetic guy to be more like that. Maybe that's just not, and you know, and he's an offensive guy, obviously. Yeah. You know, so, but he was never a coordinator, though. So. No, he was a receivers coach. Right. He went from being a receivers coach in the league to being a head college football coach. I just don't know if um, I just don't know enough about it to know. I mean, that's the tough part. But I think he could use an even more exciting offense because I think he had a very good QB this year. I'm not sure. I can't remember. I know he's had a couple, like, you know, he's got some dudes. He's just got to put it together. I mean, look, I, I don't know. Well, well, well this year, year. See, I, I feel like there's this, hard. Guys, this should be a wash year. I, I feel like some guys, you know, like, look, Nick Saban's got it rolling. You know, I feel like so, if, if you're in the middle of a building process, sometimes you nail it in this kind of COVID situation. And sometimes – Sometimes you just you're a guy that needs a certain process to get that certain things done, and COVID could affect you if you have a certain style. So, PJ Fleck has sayings all over the place. Oh like, my God, he's got more of those five thousand sayings. I think it's confusing. Personally. <laughs> Some of them but, are, very but "Road a boat" is one that resonates. But he's got a hope, you know. They have, you know, they have ski or something like that. Is like, they got all kinds of stuff, man. It, it, it's uh, what 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 was their record this year? They were they were 2019. They were 11 and two. I just think that maybe, you know, you know, maybe he just couldn't get what he needed to get done in this COVID situation. I I, I really do. I think I think I'm not 100. percent uh, I I think he just needs a little more. I, you know, I don't know. You know, his case if it's a fair assessment to judge. Often, I do think offensively at times they looked out of sorts, but maybe his style needs a uh, you know a normal situation. Every every coach is kind of different, and like some of them need to kind of. They had to adapt their style, and maybe it's not as adaptive to a situation where it's not fluid, you know. I, but I don't know. I don't know. We'll find out next year, I guess. We will. I mean, I like the way he does things. It's just, um, it, 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 we'll, we'll say. I mean, there were 11 2 in 2019. That's a huge record <coughs> for Minnesota. The question about Minnesota ultimately is. Is it a destination spot or is it a, another climbing the ladder spot? He has approached it as more of a destination spot. Right. By staying after going 11 and two. I think it's like a, I think it's a, I would think it was, you know, just a, a, a stop. Lou Holtz used it as a stop. Um, uh, there's a few guys that did. Jerry Kill did a great job. Um, he was the perfect guy for that program as a destination spot. They were good, never amazing, but they, he's a good coach. Um, if you know, if he actually is viewing it as a destination spot, I can't see why he couldn't make it one. It's just, um, I like, think if that's the way he's doing it, then yeah, I think I, he's good. I, I ultimately, Pat Fitzgerald's my good example of this Northwestern. Was always terrible, and if someone was there that did good, they got out of there. Pat Fitzgerald, being alumni, made it his destination, and in most years, every once in a while, have an average year, but right. most years he has very good years, and he's turned Northwestern into it's much program. Yeah, into a, de a a destination program now. Um, you know, and we went through that colleges thing, like they're a top ten university. I don't know. I mean, it's. It's pretty impressive because Duke 
it's actually the same approach almost that um absolutely uh what's uh, I can't believe I forgot his name the Duke head coach um he was ah oh, now it's blanking me uh Cutliff oh, yeah David Cutliff David Cutliff made Duke a destination spot rode through some of the difficulties. Every once in a while, they'll have a middle-of-the-road year, but more years than not, they're a bowl team, which, you know, if you get a place that's really good but has had struggled having a, a quote-unquote tradition, and then you stay there, especially if you're an alumni or you're a guy like David Cutcliffe who had a, a very accomplished career for many years, really kind of as an OC, and – I'm not saying that's his retirement spot, but I'm saying like wants to coach football forever, wants to put in a system, uh, be the CEO and run it and uh, use his brand combined with Duke's brand educationally to attract players. It seems like he's a perfect fit, just like Pat Fitzgerald is a really like perfect fit. Steve Spurrier was great at Duke. He won an ACC championship. But it was always a destination. Uh, it was always a a stepping ladder for Steve Spurrier because he was looking at a place where he could ultimately win a national championship. You know, so I don't know. I mean, Northwestern was close. They they actually played Ohio State tough. They did, but that yeah. comes. You know, I, there's something to be said about guys that that go to if you have that vision that I'm going to go here and I'm going to stay here for the long haul. If you have that going in. I think you're ahead of the game. Now, obviously, situations change, things like that. But if that's the way and you approach it like that, you know, like if Shiano had said, I'm going to go to Rutgers and I'm going to turn this thing around from day one and stayed here from his first time through, it'd be a dynasty. Uh, absolutely. And that's exactly right. Every once in a while, maybe he might have a middle of the road team, but every year they would be very good. Correct. The majority of years. And maybe they break through in one or two of those years. Who uh, is the who is the last guy we can look and say did that? That um did what? Turn it Saban? That like imagine if Saban had stayed at LSU. LSU or Alabama are lifetime destination spots if you could survive and win big early on. You can survive your fan base. But I mean, we're looking, if you turn it back, like, are we going back to Joe Paterno, Bobby Bowden days? Absolutely. I mean, right? Were those the last two to really do it? Right. Um, Joe Paterno, like, well, if the question is, um, I, I don't. Uh, Harry Coker at the U. Oh, I think he's. I think he's talking about guys that can hire older, older uh, head coaches at it. But yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's a good question. So did those guys go into those jobs thinking like, I'm going to be here for 40 years. Who are examples like Pat Fitzgerald and David Cutcliffe at other places? Who's uh, been at places the longest? Check I mean, it. You have to look it up. Who are the longest tenured head coaches in college football right now? Let's look it up. How long has what's his name been in Notre Dame? Oh, I'll give a good one. Although it's kind of Kirk Ferenz at Iowa. He's the longest one, guaranteed. That's what's going to come up. Like he would I, now. Iowa has a great tradition, right? So he just continued it. But I, I think he took it to a, di a different level. But remember, they had a legendary He's coach. Definitely going to be the longest tenured guy. But they had a guy that was with. Before him, the guy that was there was there forever. Um, oh, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you the guy that that's the guy I would say who's probably done it the best. Um, Mike Gundy at Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State was definitely for many years. If you were good there, you got out. Like if you were good, you moved on to the next job because it like, was. Um, but he made that a destination job. Gary Pat uh TCU, I, I guess has big tradition, so I can't count them. Like um, if, if Lincoln Riley stays at Oklahoma and rides this thing. That's the destination spot. I mean, think of their history. You, you know, Barry Switzer, um uh, uh what's his name? The guy who was there before like, 
Lincoln Riley, uh, Stoops. Stoops. Yeah, Stoops. Uh, um, Bud Wilkerson. You don't know who that is. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of other destiny. Like, what about Texas? Texas destination spot. It's not. It's not a place that people. So the places that people have. I would say Oklahoma State is a place that is not "quote unquote" a destination spot. That but he's going to stay and do it. That he's done an f- amazing job at. What if Chip Kelly stays at UCLA? UCLA is a destination spot to me. Oregon became a destination spot. Washington. Oh, uh, Stanford. You might you might say David Shaw at Stanford. Um, Are you looking at the list right now? Yeah, I am. So, so number one is Iowa. Well, I would say. Are you looking at you're looking at longest tenured head coaches, right? Well, I, I look. I'm just. I have all the head coaches. I can see how many years they've been there. Oh, so, man. Iowa has. All right. So Kirk Ferenz is 168 and 106. He's been there since 99. Yeah, he's got to be the longest. Six thirteen guy, which is. Not off the wall, but for, I mean that's for he turned it in. I, no, I mean, it, I was never bad. Yeah, I was never bad. Um, all right, so let's go. Who else has been somewhere a long time? TCU guys has been there a while. At Oklahoma, where, let me find. Let me find him. Oklahoma State. So Mike Gundy's record is he's been there since two thousand five. That's a good tenure. 136 and 67. That's pretty good. 67. Yeah. TCU, you could argue that that may not be, quote unquote, a destination spot because of the other big schools there. Gary Patterson is 178 and 74. That's pretty damn good. 71%. Hell yeah. Um, uh, Clemson, yes. Destination. Trying to think if there's any other longer tenured guys. Northwestern, we talked about Pat Fitzgerald's 105 and 81, 57%. But that's, I mean, that's impressive, I think, at Northwestern. Um, very impressive. Let's see. ACC De- Cutliffe. Cutliffe is 74 and 88. So he's actually won more than he's lost. Um, but he's but I think he must have had some really bad years in the beginning, if I'm not mistaken. Right, in order to get to where he's at now. Yeah, I think he was so – that's right. David Cutliffe was the head coach at, at Mississippi. What happened there? What, after he was at Tennessee? No, bef- bef- yes. He was, he was pretty good there. It wasn't great, I guess. That's the problem. He had yeah. one year's 10 3. All right. So Duke, yeah, you're right. In the beginning, he had he had one, two, three, four year, five years of losing records. So they stuck with him, you know, but they were kind of getting better. They know, like, look, we're never going to get a bigger name than this in to come here to Duke. We might as well stick with what we got and go. Now, here's the tough part. So he's done some had a really good year. Last year, 99, 2019, they were five and seven. This year they were two and nine. Yeah, I mean, is he so on his that, way? That may be the – that may be near – This is the end. I would think maybe three years, three more years. Maybe. Oh, if he doesn't have a good year next year, he won't be there. Right. He's got to have a good year next year. But um, I think that's uh, – oh, uh, Army head coach has done an amazing job and Navy. Todd Munkin. I, I mean, I guess you can't say quote-unquote destinations, but, but – uh, what they've done there, I think, is uh, David Shaw is a good example. He's That's, a prior, but yeah. But I mean, you look at those three, look at those four schools that we're just talking about right there. High academic schools. Yeah. Those used to be, you do well, you move and on. But those guys have stayed. I mean, so that's a pretty. Imagine cool. if Jim Harbaugh stayed at Stanford. Yeah, I know. You're right. Imagine if Chip Kelly stayed at Oregon. Ten uh, Navy's one hundred one and sixty seven. That's pretty amazing. But his name is always linked to another job. Like every year, it feels like he's going somewhere else. He he's was supposed to be at BYU. Okay, new new uh, Matalo. Yep. Davos record it. Da, da, stupid. Da, stupid. One forty and thirty two. Like he, he, 
He never lost his life. He doesn't even know what losing is. Um, and then, uh, and what about, uh, oh, Air, Air Force's coach has been there a long time, 59%, 102 and 72. Those guys, those academies, smart. They stick with, if they have somebody good, they stick with them. Nick Saban's record is insane. He's 163 and 23. And how many of those 23 losses came in the first five years of being at Bama? He's 88% winning percentage. That's bonkers. <laughs> His first year, he was two and six in Alabama. His second year, he was 12 and two. He only had one, one uh, bad year. Why did they only play eight? He coached eight games. Did he Maybe it was um, sanctions. Was he hired in the middle of the year or something? No, didn't he take over and there were sanctions? Oh, yeah, they were sanctioned, yeah. That's the only losing year that first year. And then, uh, geez, when he was at LSU, his record at LSU was bonkers too. Yep. He had the one national championship. And then he was great at Michigan State. Uh, well, actually, Michigan State, he was middle of the road until his last year. And then this he. Is a good one. one of our viewers talk, uh, talk about Frank Beamer. He had a good oh, run at Vatek. Beamer, that's a good example. Beamer did have a long. He turned it into a destination spot. Right, because Virginia Tech was nothing. That might be getting undone right now. I, I just. I don't know if. Uh, if Virginia Tech was not very good before Beamer, you're right. So he made that into a destination spot. And then the next hire, what? Oh, yeah. You know, Fuente was at Memphis. He was great at Memphis. I don't get it. Sometimes it doesn't transition. It doesn't fit. Sometimes it's not the fit, you know? It's interesting because Memphis, he was great there. Turned them around. Well, anyway, that, that's, that was interesting. Actually, that was interesting to me. I don't know if it's to you. Um, yeah, I think that that's uh, I think it's a wrap for today. Sounds good. If you like my little prospect profiles? I'll hit you hit with another one today. You're good. If you ever want to do one, you probably get a lot of those. No, I'm saying do an analysis on players. Yeah, that's what I mean. I'm saying I'm sure you get like people like. No, I'm just going through the top players, and I'm giving my own. Oh, you're giving your own spiel, kind of like certain people. Like, like I had a guy that kept tweeting. He was break, he broke down Coastal's offense <sighs> verbatim. Like he had a, for some reason he had like nine game films of Coastal or whatever, and broke them down. And he's like, "Look, I won't post tendencies until later in the week because I'm not about to do somebody else's job for them." <laughs> Social media, man. Hey, it's cool. Get, get, get you out there, so. All right, man. All right, man. I'll talk to you in a little bit. All right, brother. Thanks, guys. Later.